Welcome to another episode of the Zach Hiley Show today. I have the honor with being with Brian Till today, and he's a PGY-4 in surgery at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. He was born in San Francisco, and he went to Haverford College, where he studied political science. And then he went to the University of Vermont College of Medicine. Brian has been awarded multiple grants for his outstanding research and innovation. Amazingly, Brian is also an accomplished writer, still writing articles for such places as the New Republic, Foreign Affairs, and The Atlantic. He has also written a book, Conversations with Power. But normally I talk about statistics and things around kind of surgery, and we are going to talk about that, your opinions on residency surgery, what it's like getting into it, what the life is of a surgery resident, especially going through it in your fourth year. Uh, but I want to start with a different question. Beyond my normal questions, it seems you have kind of a different, a non-traditional career before you got into medicine with writing and politics and things like this. Can you talk a little bit about this first part before medicine, the writing and the politics and interviewing these amazing people? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me, Zach. I think this is a really cool project. And I think um, there's so many awesome things to do in medicine and anything that helps people sort of tease out specialties that they may be interested in and learn more about them is, is awesome. I think we all get a lot of exposure as med students, but inevitably you don't get to see it all and understanding why people are drawn to certain things and, and you know, upsides and downsides of all these careers is, is really valuable to aggregate. And this is a great project to try to Thank do you. that, I think. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I was, my dad's a doctor and I was not at all drawn to medicine. I frankly didn't think I could really cut it. Um, I'm like pretty dyslexic and spent a ton of time in special ed as a kid and was really going for like pass and like survive school for many years. And like, I'm very blessed to have parents who were all over it and got me the help I needed. And I don't think left alone in a public school system, I would have really been all that successful. But, um, you know, I, ma I managed to put it together and figure out basic literacy and, and get through high school um, and get to a good college. And I was really mostly interested in politics and sort of understanding the world and the forces that seem to shape events in our lives. And, and, and it just seemed so beyond anybody's understanding or control um, and I, I, apparently I like, as like a seventh grader tried to, or a fourth grader tried to write a paper about like the, you know, the reasons of, for the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is still like wow. a fascinating thing to me. But for some reason I was always just very interested in like the world and, and the force, the political forces that shape our lives. So I studied politics, um, and was super fortunate at Haverford to have really great advisors. And at that point, like the world was totally focused on the Middle East, um, so I got to spend a lot of time sort of traveling around and studying the region and, and writing a thesis on that. And uh, when I was graduating, it was the beginning of the financial collapse in like 2008 and the housing market had burst and the ACA hadn't passed yet. So like you turned 18 and you were off your parents' health insurance. And I had this sort of acute awareness that people weren't really getting the jobs that they thought they should as they graduated a couple of years ahead of me. So I took a year off from school um, and just sort of explored DC and started like writing, which was completely ironic, right? For a kid who could not figure out literacy for his life to then like be writing for pretty big papers. And uh, it was, it was just an exciting time. It was Obama's first run and I would be up in New Hampshire with him and like you know, a veterans hall with like a hundred people. I mean, they're covering him, right? Yeah. Like I'd written enough that I could get a press pass and like go to all these political events in Iowa and New Hampshire and stuff. And I would just freelance columns to different newspapers around the country. And like, that's yeah. what I did that whole spring. I like interned for, for Pat Leahy from Vermont in the Senate. And yeah. then that spring as the campaign got going, I was like, I just want to go see this like up close. Like I want to see retail politics and see how this all works. So I started writing then um, and sort of got a resume, got some contacts in DC Went back to school, finished my senior year, and then went to work for a place called the New America Foundation in, in Washington. And that was sort of my launch pad to sort of pursue, you know, writing for a bunch of, you know, fairly prominent publications and interviewing all these retired heads of state. Wow. And that's amazing. I've, I have so many questions about that. But I think the most relevant question to this podcast is how do you make the transition to medicine from yeah. this seemingly going very, very well writing yeah. career, political interests? Yeah, as you can imagine at that point, the writing was really on the wall for both print news and politics. Yeah. Um, forces in terms of just payment models as the internet came online were not calibrated and not nuanced enough. And all of a sudden news was just free. And our parents' generation paid for news, be it like paying a cable bill or like buying a newspaper. Um, and then like our generation somehow thought this was not an institution that like we needed to support. It was just there. So I, I got the sense that that was not a world I wanted to inhabit for 40 years. I sort of, um, I got to, I got to do it. I got to go really explore 
my understanding of the world and talk to these old heads of state about their experiences and what they were able to accomplish and what they weren't able to accomplish and why they think that was. And then I said, okay, like I'm ludicrously privileged. Like I can really just pick something and try. And if I fail, like it's going to suck, but it's not going to mean that like I'm impoverished or like I'm homeless or anything like that. So what do I really want to do? And I, you know, I thought about law school. I thought about, you know, learning Arabic, um, in, you know, a serious way. And, and ultimately I stepped back and I said, I would love to do surgery. Like I would love to practice medicine. There's such a burden of surgically treatable disease that's not being met around the world. Um, and you know, if I fail organic chemistry, if I fail physics, then I tried and I know I tried. So I just kind of went for it. And did you have to take these courses at a later time or were you still, yeah. Yeah. So this is, so as there's writing a book takes forever. So like the book was done, you're sort of in limbo and pre-production for like months and months. So during that point, I was sort of setting up to go to a post back at Bryn Mawr. Yeah. So I finished like, um, sort of promoting my book and then I like immediately like jumped into science classes. At Bryn Mawr? Yeah. Wow. Which was, so I went to Haverford as an undergrad, which is like a lovely Quaker college that, um, like just opened my mind and taught me how to write and taught me how to think. And um, Bryn Mawr is, is right down the road and is an equally fantastic school. And they've got like historically a very strong post back. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like I'm going to be jumping back to your medical school interviews right now. But how did you decide? Was there a moment? Was there an experience with a patient or something like that where you said, because in my mind, it, you could have a successful career. as You've already written a book, right? As a full-time writer, a reporter or something in that career. What? what made you switch to say, you know what, I want to go to medicine, I want to do surgery? Was it an event? Was it some topic you were researching? You said, listen, because I know you mentioned this treatable disease, my yeah. surgery could help. You know, I don't, the, the like, during that whole span where I was in D.C. and, like, studying foreign policy and writing about foreign policy and, um, like, the Iraq and Afghanistan were just, like, raging and, like, they were going badly. And um, I started volunteering at Walter Reed in their surgical ICU and, like, meeting these, like, kids, like, these people younger than me who had, literally like lost limbs and like suffered severe mental injuries and, and, and died, you know, for this country. And it was sort of like, like, what am I doing? And, um, I, you know, I, I was sort of, I was drawn to a lot of the surgeons I met there. I was drawn to the, to the fix, right. To ha- to seeing people who came back and seemed irreparable being able to then leave a hospital. Um, and so that after learning about all of these people so much smarter than me, in ways that they had failed to like face these massive problems that the post cold war generation failed on and we're looking at now and failing on it it seemed really nice to be able to have someone in front of you and potentially fix them yeah yeah and i'm i'm going to jump ahead a little bit but what are your ultimate goals with yeah so i've you know i've i, I can't say enough about a general surgery um training. I think I've been interested in cardiothoracic surgery, like from day one, I was fortunate to spend like my whole summer after my first year on a foundation, on a grant from the um, AATS, one of the big cardiothoracic foundations, um, doing research and hanging out with a, with a fantastic cardiothoracic surgeon who was in Vermont at that point. Um, But, you know, even with all these integrated programs, like people aren't isolated disease states, particularly people who are getting cardiothoracic surgery. For the most part, they're older individuals who have many comorbidities often in their one liner. And so I think being able to understand vascular disease and people having diabetic fat wounds and people having, you know, SMA stenosis and things like that is critical when you're going to take them to the OR, even if it's for their lung cancer or their esophageal cancer, because other things happen when you put people under that much stress. So general surgery to me afforded like the broadest training I could get um, in surgery. And you know, also has a huge focus on taking care of really sick people. Like it doesn't matter if you had an orthopedic surgeon taking care of you or an ENT surgeon taking care of you initially. Like when you get really sick, like you end up with us and under mm-hmm. our care. And I think I was I was drawn to that. Yeah. And it sounds like you knew before you even got to medical school you wanted to do this. It's it's because because I came into medical school thinking psychiatry, right? Yeah. And now I'm doing internal medicine. Um but you knew going in, surgery is what I want to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a strong sense. I left, you know, I, I left I left tons of room to switch out of that. Like, I was okay. not so rigid as to be like, I have to do this. Like, I'm older, too, is the other thing, right? Yeah. And I knew I was committing to a long training course if I wanted to pursue a general surgery board certification yeah. and a cardiothoracic certification on top of that. So, I mean, it's fun. Like, I loved psych. Like yeah. psych and surgery really at the end of it where the, the really? two are sort of like on a pedestal uh-huh. and like I was like, what's the overlap here? And so, Very so, different. Somebody said to me, they're the two most invasive specialties. And I was like, <laughs> do I like that about me? Whatever. Um, but, you know, I think, I don't think there was a rotation hours on that I was like, 
I couldn't do this. Yeah. Like, I really, I loved all of it. I wasn't great at all of it. Like, yeah. Neurology, like, snuck by on that shelf, you know? Um, but, Me like, too. it's, um, I don't know. I think I would say to med students going through, don't, don't let yourself be winnowed down. Like, show up every day being like, I want to do this. And I'm going to convince myself this is something I could do and be happy my whole life. And if you get to the end and you don't feel that way, you try, right? You try yeah. to really appreciate the beauty of that medicine and the nuances of the care they deliver. Um, and the same thing for every, like, residency interview you go on, just show up and be like, I want to go here. Yeah. I'm going to tell them why I fit here. Yeah. And I'm going to convince myself that this is a place that I can have support and be happy and thrive. Yeah. And if you get to the end of it and you're like, this isn't the place for me, you know you tried. You honestly tried. you gave tried. full effort in yeah. each place. Yeah. You really, you just have to lean in on all this stuff. I think that's my yeah. opinion. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And during your surgery clerkship, did it did it did it click when you had that first clinical experience, or was it like I kind of knew it all along and I still like it? Yeah, it was more that like yeah. you know, so that that first summer I got to spend with Dr. Schmoker um, in the cardi cardiac rooms at Vermont. Like you know, it was amazing. They had me like closing chests and closing legs from saphenous vein grafts, and I was like, I was like, this is this is really cool. And yeah. and watching these folks post up and um, seeing really sick people and trying to understand like the pressors and their management and how that differed from a general surgery patient. And, you know, knowing when someone needed to take, be taken back, knowing when someone needed to have their chest left open, all of that was so enticing to me that then going um, and doing general surgery, I was like, this, this stuff's cool too. Yeah. But I really like that stuff. Um, so even in your clerkship, you knew CT surgery was interesting. Yeah. Wow. I think after my MS one year that summer, yeah. I was like, pretty much locked on CT. And do you think entering medical school at a later age had more to do in you making these more finalized decisions earlier than other med students or not really? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think, um, you know, part of, I, in some ways, I think there's this weird dyslexic thing too. Like, there's a lot of really cool um, writing from, like, people who are super um, successful despite being dyslexic. Yeah. And one of the things, I think it was either um, Tony Cosgrove, who was the head of the Cleveland Clinic Forever, or Charles Schwab. I can't remember which one of it was. They were like, I just, I see the answer really fast. Like, I like, um, and not when it's a, do you know a fact question? Yeah. But when it's a complex problem and we're trying to get a group of people or a system to get to an answer, okay. they feel like they could see the roads to get there like really quickly. And mm. sometimes it was like much harder for people to do that. And for me, like the data just triangulated, like that's what I want to do. Yeah. Like yeah. I, these are the, like in my mind, I was like, these are the things I like about it. I'm going to end up there. I don't have to go there. My yeah. suspicion is strong that CT is the kind of thing I'm going to want to do. And I don't know that, like, I got a match. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's a ferociously competitive match, and I'm hopeful I'll be able to match and match somewhere I can get very good training. But like I said, it's a long road. I'm nowhere near the yeah. end. Dyslexia seems like a decent hurdle to, to jump over. Yeah. How how did you get over it? Yeah, so um, there's a there's a very cool institute in Vermont called the Stern Center for Language and Learning yeah. that um, I, I've been on the board of now for, like, probably five or six years. Um, and they, they more or less saved me, you know, and I, so two days a week after school from like second grade, probably through seventh grade, I was there just like grinding. And that was the hard part of my day. Like going to school was not hard. Like I would sort of like negotiate and get out of like having to do a writing assignment yeah. or something like that. But then you get there and it's you alone one-on-one -on -one, and you're literally like rewiring your brain and the pathways to try to make sense of these, like, you know, these, these just smudges on paper. Um, and it's, um, it's like, it's intensive language therapy. Um, and I, you know, I, I won't try to go into the, like the science of it. Yeah. I don't want to butcher it. There's a lot of great books. If people out there are interested in this, like, feel free to email me. I'm brian.till at jefferson.edu and I can link you up with some of the cool research. But um, it, it's labor intensive, but I was fortunate enough to have parents, one who recognized it and two financially could support me to go to a place yeah. like that. It's, it's just, did you take kind of some of the strategies, maybe not the specific strategies for dyslexia, but the strategies of overcoming kind of these hardships to go to, you know, a very tough training program, a surgery training program? Do, I, you, do you have any of these like thoughts of these yeah. maybe beliefs or feelings? Like, for example, I was an engineer, right? I, it wasn't super hard, right? Yeah. But I feel like I apply some of these engineering aspects to medicine and studying and, and it, maybe in a different way than some of my colleagues. Do you take, what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say is it was challenging, right? Yeah. And how do you attack challenging things? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, um, like that's another thing that comes up in a lot of interviews with yeah. with these folks who are fairly prominent who have been dyslexics um, was that there is like some level of like resilience and grit for a lack of a better word that comes with it. I think also I had a very intense lacrosse coach at Haverford. He's um his name Mike Murphy and he's uh, the coach at Penn now and they've really built a great program there um, since he built a strong program at Haverford and he um 
he kicked our butts. Like he kicked our butts, like intellectually, like he understood the game on such a fundamentally like different level, like in a way that I didn't, I didn't appreciate that someone could like have that kind of conceptual model of a sport in time and space in the way that you move. Um, and then like, he just had no tolerance for any of it, you know, like a bunch of like fairly privileged 18 to 20 year old men. He like, wasn't willing to take it in terms of us slacking in the classroom or us, um, you know, not being anything other than, uh, than, than professionals and how we went about stuff And that, that was a really positive force in my life. And I think for a lot of my classmates, um, and so the, the level of discipline that came with being a part of that team was, was pretty profound. So I think between those two experiences and then also like being a post back at Bryn Mawr, like you just like, you just get up at 5am and you hit it. You know what I mean? I was just getting up transcribing lectures from the day before, because that's what I have to do to put stuff in my brain and then go into new lectures and transcribing those. And, um, that was a good setup for med school in terms of like what kind of work it was going to take yeah. for me to get through something like that. Yeah. What is the, again, a general question that's off the, off the written track here, yeah. but what is the hardest thing you've done? Is it surgery residency? Oh yeah. 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 I mean, it's, um, you know, I think that in a day as a surgery resident, there's so many forces pulling at you. You know what I mean? There was the constant need to take in information, um, and like prepare there's like for that, like to take information and like take care of the patients who are in front of you, who, who you've operated on already you simultaneously need to be like taking in information about the people you're going to operate on that day and like making plans and setting yourself up for success in their management. Right. And then while you're operating, like there's all the stuff that you need to know about the case. There's all the stuff you need to do to project, um, to whoever's taking you through the case, like your abilities and your confidence so that you can be leading and not following in the case. Right. Like there's a huge distinction between, you know, a lot of times a junior resident like has the bovi cautery in their hand and they're like actually cutting the tissues and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing the case. They're not, right? The mm. person with the right angle who is actually picking out the planes and doing the dissection, like they're doing the case. So I think later in your, your training, you reach a point where you start to really internalize like how much of this am I doing? Like how much of this am I dictating versus following? And so you have all those other like forces and things you're trying to do, plus you're trying to perform in this case. And then you get out of the OR and like it's back to all of those patients, right? Mm. And like, sometimes you're getting called in the OR and they're like, what do you want to do with this? So you're trying to operate, you're trying to make a decision about, does someone need to go to the ICU? Do they need to be worked up? Like, what are we going to do with this patient? So I think just the, the cognitive demands are so big um, all the time, but like the rewards are profound. You know, when you get someone who's sick, like through a big surgery and they leave the hospital and they get back to their family, it's the best feeling in the world. It's, yeah. It really is. Yeah. Can you take me through an average tough day as a general yeah. surgery resident? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like they all feel like they are. Yeah. You know, I think, so, um, and, there, and, and the thing is, it's so much um, role shifting too. Like, you know, one week I'm on transplant and the next, like, you're on trauma, right? Yeah, which you're week, on you're on right now. Yeah, right? yeah. And a week after, you know, a month after that or whatever, like you suddenly have to pivot and you're on like surgical oncology. And each of the services have so much of their own character. But, you know, I mean, I typically wake up like at four, like I get up, um, I like walk my dog. Um, I get to the hospital pretty quick. And then I'm working through charts. Like I'm getting all the data I can about people from overnight. I'm like reconfirming stuff that I think I know about them, right? Because as you've learned in med school, like as soon as you think you've learned something, like you actually haven't and you need to go tweak it. And it's like, am I sure that they're on all their home meds that I want their, them to be on? Has something changed overnight where I need to alter all their meds? Um, and then, um, you know, we run the list as a team um, and somewhere in between there, I'll try to go see like the sick patients for sure. Anybody that's in the ICU, anybody that's tenuous, I want to go see them and examine them myself. And then when we're running the list with the team, one, it's a space to like confirm all the information that you've pulled out to make sure that it's corroborated on a second pass. And then two, that's like an, op that's an oppor opportunity to like to be teaching, right? And talking to the med students or the junior residents about like, are they able to actually take that information and make an interpretation, right? A lot of times they're like, they can tell you what the lab values are and what the exam is, but they don't know yet what they want to do mm -hmm. with that. And so you, it's a real art and I'm like still learning it for sure to be able to like be confirming your information and making sure you agree with their assessments and their data that they've gathered, but then also like pushing them to be like, well, what do you think? Like, Teaching what does that indicate to you? Yeah. yeah. What, like, what do you want to do? How does that fundamentally change what we thought we were going to do for this patient that day? Um, and then as soon as you're through that, like you are having conversations with like one, two, three, four attendings, depending on what service you're on to tell them what you see going on, what you want to do about it. And that's like where the learning really happens, right? When you kick it up to that next level and they say like, yeah, I agree with you on this, but I want to do this and here's why. 
And like mm-hmm. trying to like hold on to that, like what they give you in those conversations is just massive because that's that's when you get the pearls. That's when you really get sort of a senior person's understanding um, that you can only get to through experience. Yeah. Like yeah. you can't read that. You can't fake that. You can only do that when you've done this over and over again. And then you're on to the OR, right? And then like your what day time actually is it at this starts. Point? What time is it? I mean, when so our to your ORs, our ORs in theory should start around seven. Got it. But like even that, like at a lot of like busy urban hospitals, like you got to be there. Like you have to get your feet in the OR and they're going to yeah. be like, well, do you want this? And do you want this? And so like you have to like have a plan, like what instruments you want, like what adjuncts are you going to need? What meds do you want to use in the case? You know, and anesthesia is going to be like, do you want to do this? Do you want to position this way? So then, you know, you got a whole bunch more decisions to make and you want to show that like you've prepared and you know how you're going to tackle this case. But there's some of those where if you mess them up and you like are wrong, then the attending is going to be like upset because it's mm-hmm. going to delay the case to like move the patient or do something and change it all. So it's it's a real balancing act between like um, knowing your limits and knowing how much you can do and also like growing and pushing yourself to make, yeah. you know, to make decisions. So you're so you're in the OR Best case scenarios, would you say seven thirty? Yeah, seven thirty. Okay, and then you're in a case. Of course, cases vary in length. Yeah. Um, but say you do your first case, and say you finish at lunchtime. Yeah. Lunch? Do you go out for an hour to take lunch, <laughs> or what do you do? You know, the one good thing about being back um, from a research year I was on last year is like my weight is better because okay, like good. lunch is hit or miss. Like <laughs> lunch is truly like could happen or may not happen. Um, so, you know, there's, it may be that you have like three new consults you got to see, or it may be that you have two rooms running and like, you're going to bounce to the next room, um, without really much of a break in between. So lunch is kind of hit or miss. Um, and then it's more operating all day, more getting updates about like consults and people on the floor and how they're doing. And then, um, hopefully sometime in the afternoon, your cases wrap. And then it's like back to the beginning, right back to aggregating data, back to rounding, seeing patients, seeing if they're advancing, seeing what the hangups were. Right. So you put a plan in motion at 7 a.m. And the most important thing for your interns is one on a surgery service to start developing technical skills, like get to the OR whenever you can and start learning that stuff. But like the second most important thing to that is getting clinical judgment. And the third most important thing is executing. Mm -hmm. Like interns make the world go round and I don't think they get enough credit, right? But like they have to take all of this information that you hand them and execute on plans against a system that's like, strained, right? Like all of these hospitals have case managers, nurses, physical therapists, wound care specialists who probably are being asked to do more than they can. So you as a junior resident, it's your job to make that machine work for the patients and figuring out how to do that is a real, is a real skill. Yeah. Yeah. So you get out of the OR as a chief and you got to sit down with them and we got to be like, okay, where are we? What worked? What didn't work? Yeah. How are we going to react to that? Yeah. So, so what time do you go home? You know, it's so day and rotation yeah. dependent. Like if you're on transplant, you get to the end of the day and it may be like, all right, we're going to Chicago. We got to go get a liver. You know what I mean? Like or cool, we're, yeah. we got a kidney that's fell out of the sky because somebody else somewhere else didn't think it was good enough. But we think we could do a complex yeah. vascular repair and we're going to give it to this person because they're probably not going to get another kidney. And mm-hmm. being off dialysis, even if it's for two or three years, is going to be a higher quality of life for them. Yeah. So you don't, you just, it so you depends on the rotation you're on when it ends, which yeah. is tough, which is really tough for your family, which is tough for your kids. Yeah. It's tough for your dog. So, yeah. you know, I think it's, that's one thing you sort of have to expect um, yeah. if you want to be a part of this and if you want to lean in. Um, that which it you could say be a you lot. should definitely need to. I think you have to, you know, yeah. I think, I think I've been blessed to go to a place that really pushes us um, to try to be as, good of clinicians and as good of surgeons as we can be. And I think the only way that you get the most out of a place like that is if you're, you want more, like, is it, if you like get to the end of the day and you can be like, yep, I'm interested to go scrub in on this case or I'm interested, you know, they need someone to go on a procurement. Like I'm down for that. Let's, Let's go. Yeah. It's an interesting thing you said earlier. And I think it's a common misconception. A lot of people going into surgery who don't really maybe are in their first year or second year of medical school. The interns aren't always in the OR. Right? No, there's things, no, no. There's no. other things they're doing. They, so the interns on pretty much every service, no matter what you're doing, like you have to learn how to make a hospital work for your patients, right? Like that is the bedrock of all of this stuff is you have attending surgeons who sort of over, they're the quarterbacks. They oversee the whole thing. You have senior residents who um, should be trying to play that role, but they need someone watching over them. And then you have junior residents whose job it is to is to figure out how to make the system work for the patients, right? So how to get imaging done well, how to get lab draws done on time, 
how to get outpatient stuff set up. If someone needs to go home on antibiotics, if they need home physical therapy, if they need a complex wound vac at their nursing home, like none of that happens on its own. And like all of it really falls to the junior residents to like make it happen. And, you know, when they can't or don't know how, then the senior residents have to be able to sort of take them through that. And that's like a real skill set. Like that takes months to learn when you first get here. And it's a ton because you're trying to like take all this like, you know, conceptual knowledge you learned as a med student, integrate that into the real world. Yeah. And also like do this thing that nobody's talked about. Nobody's taught you anything about how to actually make a hospital work the whole time you've been in medical school, yeah. right? Like yeah. that's just like gone. So okay. it's, a, it's a whole thing. And then there's these other clinics, like nobody teaches you like how to manage a Foley, right? Like when you're in med school. Yeah. Like nobody's like, well, these are your three options when somebody's Foley comes out and they don't pee. Like what yeah. are you going to do? So I think we, we have a long way to go in medical education in terms of like teaching med students like the actionable knowledge that they need as an intern. Um, but like it would make it a little better, I think, for the interns when they yeah. showed up if they knew some of that stuff. Yeah. But like also like that's just the nature of the beast in modern American medicine. Yeah. Like it's just too much to swallow for anybody. And so you just have to show up. You have to have a really good attitude in the face of sometimes tremendous adversity. And you have to lead a team to like deliver the best care you can for your yeah. patients. Yeah. Another common misconception, I think, is that it's not only hospital time. It's not only OR time. Uh, maybe not in med school, but maybe people outside of med school is you're also spending time in the clinic. Right? Yeah, As yeah. An intern. So I think one of the, um, you know, you should, there's like very clear ACGMA rules that you should like be in clinic like one day a week. And like that is another place where you get those pearls, right? A lot of times that's you sitting at the, you know, at the elbow of an attending or, a, you know, a fellow. And um, the cadence is, is hopefully sometimes like a little bit slower and different. Um, and if you prepare well for clinic and you sort of have an idea who the patients are, have an idea what you think the attending is going to want to do with them you can put that expectation against what they actually do. And you can say, hey, like, I was expecting you were going to offer this surgery. Like, why are you going to do this instead? So that's really high yield learning too. And I yeah. think a lot of the a lot of surgery residents sort of shy from clinic and like post, you know, during COVID, there was like clinic didn't exist. And I think like there's still in some places like um, a reintegration that's happening, but like that's, it's tremendous learning. Like Karen Chinaki is an amazing yeah. general surgeon and every time I'm in the green surgery clinic, like I learned so many things. Yeah. Um, she's so awesome. And, you know, Nate Evans and Dr. Okasanya and Dr. Grenda, like thoracic clinic is like, I, I wish I could designate like two months to just go sit yeah. there, you know, cause like going through CAT scans with them and talking about, you know, different trials in terms of uh, chemo management, all of that's so valuable. And the interesting thing Dr. Okasanya said to me when, when I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago is he said he actually thinks the clinic is more important than the OR. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to not believe that because um, you feel very like self-important when you're yeah. there, like trying to do a surgery, but yeah. in reality, like they still predominantly are doing a surgery. Yeah. Um, as you get to be a senior resident, like you shift that balance in more basic cases, like you are doing the surgery. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you, th there's like this old adage that it's, I, I'll probably get it wrong, but it's like, you can teach them when to operate in 12 months, but it takes like years to know when not yeah. to operate. Yeah. And like, there's, there's so much truth to that. Like there's people you see in clinic and those judgment calls about who you take for a big surgery are really difficult yeah. because I don't, most patients have no perception of what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. And I think this is where patient reported outcomes has a long way to go. And like general surgery really needs to lean in on this. Yeah. Orthopedic surgery has done like really incredible stuff and it continues to evolve, but like using psychometrics and really good data about patients' physical status um, to then inform like who we offer surgery to is, is just like something we desperately need. Yeah. But like being in clinic, understanding what surgeries senior attending want to do, why they want to do it as opposed to the alternatives and who they're electing not to operate on. Like that's, that is a, again, that's one of those things that you don't learn in six years like that. You can only get through experience and repetition. Yeah. Um, and so clinic time is just, is super valuable. Yeah. Can you take me through briefly kind of the years of general surgery residents? So you're an yeah. intern, uh, junior resident. Yeah, totally. So you show up as an intern. And like I said, like you're trying to get to the OR whenever you can. One, because like it feels great. And you're like, yes, this is this is why I want to do this. I love doing this. Yeah. Um, two, you're trying to like really learn clinical judgment and understand like why your chiefs are doing what they're doing and like why attendings are doing what they're doing. Um, and then like third, you're learning how to like make the hospital work, right? Um and that's that's sort of that experience. You need to be like the first one, like 
at every ROT and like at every code and like figure out how to manage those complex situations and how to make the hospital work for your patients in those moments and when you're on like a routine post-operative course. As a two and a three, the experience is so different like hospital to hospital. Like we at Jeff, as twos, we chief the ICU. Yeah. And um, we have awesome critical care fellows at Jeff. There's just two of them a year. Um, and they take much more of an attending role where they sort of step back. And like as a PGY2 in the morning when you're running the list on anywhere from 18 to 30 critical care patients, like all of the interns who are there from different services, all of the advanced practice practitioners, who there's usually like two to four of them, they're looking at you and like you're dictating the plan for the day. And that's a plan that's going to be set in motion until you round on a patient, which may not be till 11 a.m. if you have that many patients. So it, it really forces us, I think, to... Um, to think really hard and have a lot of ownership of patients and um, coordinate closely with the chief residents of different services. But that's, you know, that it varies in a lot of yeah. places, like who is sitting in that seat running in ICU. And for us, it's the PGY2s. And then as uh, PGY3s, um, you know, we, we, we also like lead in a lot of ways. Like, so you're the chief of a thoracic surgery service, a general thoracic surgery service with no fellows. You're a chief on transplant. There's a fellow on there, but like, every case needs two senior residents. Yeah. Like every time we do a liver, like somebody's out procuring it and ever, somebody's at home doing the hepatectomy for the recipient, which is some people think the most dangerous part of the whole thing, mm. right? So you lead in a lot of ways that year as well. Then we go out to the lab after the third year. Um, some places you go out after PGY2. I think it's nice to go out after three. I think you've gotten a much larger breadth of the different options and have right. a better idea what you want to go into if you want to go into a fellowship. Um, and then you can sort of make your research align with that. And then you go out for one, two, three years, depending on what you're doing and what your interests are. And then you come back for chief years. Um, and how those are split are really different in different places. We're pretty trauma heavy here. We're in Center City, Philadelphia, and we, we see a lot of trauma of all kinds. We see a great deal of penetrating trauma. Um, we see blunt force stuff on the highways that are close by that used to go to Hahnemann, but there's no Hahnemann anymore. So it all comes to Jeff. Um, and then we, we are a huge hospital network now. We're the biggest in the city. And so we get a ton of transfers from outside hospitals for stuff that they think is um, too complex to manage. So nightmare abdomens, um, really complex trauma with ortho and- Nightmare you know, abdomen, is that a thing? Or is that just yeah. you describing a bad- I mean, I, it's I, in my world, it's a thing. Yeah. So people who have had reoperations and leaks and have like multiple mm -hmm. IR drains, sometimes their bowel is not in continuity. Like it's, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens to people, um, and it's it's a privilege to take care of them. And a, a lot of them in the Philadelphia area end up at Jeff. Um, but it yeah. can it can be really complex interdisciplinary management. Like it takes surgery a lot of times, a lot of times it takes gastroenterology, a lot of times it takes interventional radiology, and we sort of are the quarterbacks for a lot of that as chief residents. Um, and then, of course, we're on the, the gross surgery service with Dr. Yo, who's um, a prominent uh, pancreatic, really, I should say, an HPB surgeon. Um, and, you know, the opportunity to stand across from him and do a ton of Whipples and distal pank and spleens um, is is pretty unprecedented. And, you know, at a, at a thousand bed urban tertiary quaternary medical center, most places that's a fellow or a super fellow doing those cases. But for us, it's a PGY-5. And I think that's just such a fundamental capstone of being yeah. here. Um, it's a special thing. That's great. You have a fantastic attitude towards this, by the way. I just wanted to mention that because it's, it's a nice, it's a, it's a, distinction that I hear a lot between people who are clearly passionate about, they say, I get to do this as opposed to I have to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's a great, it's a great distinction. I know we're running out of time here. So I wanted to ask two more final questions. Is there anything you wish you knew before going into general surgery residency? You know, I think I, and I think this goes along a little bit with being like a little bit older, but I think I had like kicked the tires pretty well. And I got, um, I developed really good relationships with a lot of the residents of Vermont where I went to med school. And I think I saw with pretty open eyes um, how challenging it can be and how frustrating it could be at times. Um, I think I wish I knew, I wish I better appreciated how broad of a knowledge base they expected. Like to, to, to sit for the American um, Board for General Surgery exams, like, the extent of knowledge you need to bring to bear is just, it's just massive. Like, yeah. you know, you, you have to be prepared to think about and manage stuff that you've never seen and will never see. Um, and so I think that's, you know, I, I think that's good. Like, I think we should constantly be pushing ourselves to understand the physiology of as many organ systems as we can because they all interact as you've learned. Um, 
but you know, I think that's, you know, I think that's a real challenge. And like, you know, I, I we sit for the ab site every year, which is our in-service training exam. And I've been lucky to do like reasonably well on that. But it's, I think it's a daunting thing at the end of all of this to know just how much you have to assimilate. Mm. Um, so I think people should, people should go into the field, like with open eyes about that and about the fact that there's like a non- um, there's a non-zero failure rate, so you yeah. can do all the all you can do all this work. And like you rate, said, yeah. you you have to sit for the written and oral exams, and and I think that's that's challenging, but that's a specialty. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really helpful. And if I'm a medical student, like maybe say my first or second year of medical school, and I'm interested in general surgery, yeah. should there be people I talk to? Should I be doing research? What should I do to make myself the most competitive applicant towards this tough? and yeah. competitive residency. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing um, you have to you have to really sort of internalize is the decision between the integrated tracks and true general surgery now. So like if you want to do plastics or cardiothoracic or vascular, um, you know, it, you really have to talk to the folks at your institution in those specialties and figure out the benefits and the downfalls of doing a straight tracked program yeah. as opposed to doing general surgery first. Um, I think there will continue to be pressure on general surgery as a training because of those, those tracks, right? So, um, if your institution adds an integrated plastics program, like that's going to cut into your plastics volume. So like at Jeff, like it's awesome because like we're a big urban tertiary quaternary center that doesn't have any of those, right? We have yeah. minimal fellows and none of those integrated tracks. So we have a really special place that I did not appreciate like when I was applying. And I think there's a narrative when you're applying of like, oh, you don't want fellows, they steal your cases. And then the places with a ton of fellows are like, no, we have all these fellows because we have so much volume, it doesn't matter. And the truth, like most things, is somewhere in the middle, right? I am biased by the fact I'm at a place that has like so few fellows and no integrated tracks. And I can see how substantially having an integrated plastics fellow would steal what's an awesome rotation for us as ones yeah. and as fours and how having an integrated vascular tract would steal like a ton of really great volume from us. But, um, I think that's, that's just a relationship that's complex and it's hard to really appreciate from outside an institution. But, um, it, it's just something I wish I had been aware of as I was applying. Yeah. I'm fortunate to end up in a place where we have like huge volume, huge complex volume and minimal fellows. And I think that for me and at this place is a really good equation um, but as much as you can kick the tires on really understanding the interplay between who an institution is training and how that impacts the general surgery resident volume and case mix is important. Got it. Got it. Well, this was extremely helpful, Brian. What are you, where are you running off? Do you have a case you're going to or what are you, what yeah, are you going to next? It's, it's time to get back yeah. into it. There's like three or four things on the board and some folks in the ED to see. So we will, um, I'll Exciting. jump in with my team and get back to it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. This was really helpful. It was such a pleasure. Anytime. I'm awesome. glad to come back. Maybe we'll Anytime have you back and useful. talk more about these, uh, these interviews, I think. Anytime, Zach. Be <laughs> thank well, you, man. sir. Thank you, sir. Take care. Well, welcome back, Ryan. We're here for part two. You're just coming from call. You look fantastic. I was just commenting on how much I love your hair. Thank you. And it's I don't it's think, my bed head look. And I don't think you need a haircut. We'll see what the people <laughs> on the internet say, but this will be about six months after that anyway. This, so. this, is a, this is a sign that it was a good night, like not a terrible <laughs> night. That it actually looks like I... My hair, when it's a bad night, is like standing on end. And when it's a good night, I have some bed head in the back. The uh, stress sweat kind of makes it go yeah. really straight up. My in interns and twos love making fun of me. They like You can tell exactly how your night was based on your hair. Based on the way your hair looks. Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks good today, so it was a good night. Thank you. So we're going to start with a question that I didn't get to ask last time, but I really wanted to ask, and I ask everyone. So if I gave you $100 million, and I want you to try and imagine yourself three years as an attending. So you've done your fellowship. You've done your fellowship in CT, uh, and now you've done three years as an attending. And now I give you, but it's only an offer right now. I give you $100 million tax-free. It's in your account. You can do whatever you want with it. Would you A think, what right now, continue practicing full-time as an attending, mm -hmm. B, change to part-time, C, switch careers, or D, go live in a beach somewhere and, and uh, ride it out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really fun question. I think we have the... I, I don't know if somebody won the Powerball, but every time I've been in Wawa this week, it's like climbing up into oh, the billions, and I'm like, oh my God. Billions? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I would undoubtedly keep practicing medicine. Yeah. Like I love surgery and as long as I'm like physically able to be a competent yeah. um, surgeon and take care of people, like I want to do that for as long as I can. So I think um, it would be really nice for like a lot of reasons. I mean, I think I would first like unleverage a lot of my peers who are like in tremendous debt to the 
to the uh, U.S. federal government for wanting to serve the population as physicians. But you'd actually um, give money to your to your friends. Oh, a lot. Like I, I would take a lot of people's debt and just wipe it. You know, hopefully by then, it's mostly just those of us like on a surgical tract who are still in debt, yeah. and pretty much everybody else has managed been able to like clear the decks a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it's just I think um, maybe you will see, maybe you will not. I don't know. Sort of you know your finances, but like it's it is way more stressful, I think, than people realize to be like a young doctor and like starting a family um, and being in like a very turbulent economy. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. my wife and I together are a million dollars in debt and like wow. that that weighs on you. And I think childcare, as everybody knows, is like it's a crisis in this country, like the cost um, and the availability of childcare, like it is limiting to the economy. Yeah. Um, and it's among the many things that we have not been able to solve in a, in a meaningful way. So yeah, I would definitely like it would it would mean a lot just um in terms of my own, you know, financial security and, and being able to like help out like a lot of like classmates and peers and people who I who I really respect. And, you know, I think um I would love I would absolutely continue practicing surgery. I think what I do would probably change a little bit. Okay. I think um, you know, I, I have a huge interest in, in global health and I think the scale of surgical disease in low and middle income, middle income countries is like truly overwhelming for anybody that's like traveled or spent time studying it. And I think um, there's a lot of us in U.S. medicine who would love to have the time and space to really be trying to be in impactful in global surgery, but to do that while also like affording, you know, your kids the opportunities you want them to have financially, that's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, what I would do would hopefully shift towards um, something that has like a foothold in, in U.S. healthcare, but also affords space to be a meaningful collaborator to people who, I, who I've met and who inspire me in low and middle, in middle income countries. And I think I would just like write a lot more too. Yeah. You know, I think I would um, try to carve out space, like really like a day a week at least to be doing what you're doing right now, which yeah. is like seeking out interesting people and, and narrative and data and trying to share that in a meaningful way. Yeah. I think that would be sort of what I would try to do. So the answer is B. The answer is B. The answer is part time. Yeah, yeah. Got it. I think it Got would be. It. I would still very much um, be the hours of like a full time surgeon, but like that's you know with like some built in flexibility about yeah. where I'm practicing. Yeah. Um, but I mean, no, I still like you know most academic surgeons are sort of like two days a week OR, like a day a week clinic. Yeah. And then one day that's like kind of a hodgepodge, and one day that's like. Um, like truly like admin time and like yeah. research and like moving the ball down the field yeah. on projects that are hopefully meaningful for the health system. And I think it's an important thing you said earlier because I think when we come into medical school, going into education, we don't think about the debt. We yeah. don't think about it. And that's a crazy number. You said $1 million. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. Did you, were you aware that it would be about that when you started medical school or is this kind of something? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, we both have like, our, you know, our medical school debt. Um, yeah. And then like we bought a house because it just doesn't make sense to like, like, money on fire, yeah. like paying rent at this point in our yeah. lives. So, I mean, I think we were like aware that that, that was a possibility, but it's just, it just um, like it hits a little different when you're like sitting here and, you know, you talk to all these like attendings, yeah. they're like, stop. They're like, it's all fine. It's yeah. all going to work out. But like they, their generation did not get saddled with this level of debt. You yeah. know what I mean? And I think people vastly underestimate um, how destabilizing like a lot of force in global politics and climate change and energy and food scarcity can be like in the next 50 years. And yeah. so it's not like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the United States economy is the place that I would want to be like yeah. hedging, right? It is the reserve currency of the world for a reason and it will be for, for a very long time. Yeah. But I mean, I think um, everybody that's sort of like roses and sunshine. Like, yeah. And we're it's, recording it's this November, what is it today? The 14th? Or something? I uh, know. Monday's the 14th, so it's got to be like... Like the 11th. 12th, well, it's one of those days. Yeah, it's 11th, between 11th. November 10th and November 14th. It's between those <laughs> yeah. days. Yeah, because it's. I just wanted to point that out again because it's something I think a lot of people don't think about when yeah. they're going. So you have to re like really love this, number one. I think that's just because time, lifestyle, anyway, that you're committing to. But you have to realize this is something that you're going to need to be in for a while to pay back kind of yeah. the debt that you've, that you've got put into. What is the best thing about being a surgeon? Let's get happy. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of really awesome things about it. I think for a lot of us, there's sort of like a quiet in the OR, right? Where yeah. like everything else has to fall away. Like the stresses and um, sort of things that sort of just like nag at you. Like it, you have to be so present and so focused like for that patient that 
time like literally just kind of like disappears and in every now and then you sort of like look at a clock and you're like oh my god um so i think that's something that's really special and i think the next the, the you know the the relationships you can have with your patients is just something that you i don't think you find really anywhere else in the world like maybe like the clergy kind of experience it but to have someone who is that scared um for them for their family and to like walk that path with them is just it's truly unique. So I'd say those are the two biggest things that really yeah. jump at me. Yeah. That's, that's a, and, and I think it's something that you can't really know. I mean, I don't really, I only know a little taste of this, right? As a medical yeah. student speaking to patients, but I can imagine it's amplified even more when you're the real person who's actually responsible. For yeah. And care. to be clear, like I'm still not right. Like yeah. I think it's an, it's a whole other level, like talking to like attending mm-hmm. surgeons when it's like, do you like book them for the, or, yeah. like you together, like you talking to your, colleagues and stuff and you with this patient like make a decision that we're going to do like a big challenging surgery so i I don't i mean i look forward to that too i think there's a difference in how you feel in terms of your responsibility like all of us as residents like feel a deep responsibility to our patients but my wife who's now a junior attending and people like dr okasanya and you talk to people who have been doing this for like a while now and like it's a whole other tier that like you don't even know exists like in terms of like waking up in the middle of the night and just like frantic stress because you've taken someone's life in yeah. your hands. You know, yeah. it's as fundamental as that. Yeah, so no, it's, it's a, huge. It's a thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> and you got to be ready for it. So the counterpoint to that question is, what's the worst thing about being a surgeon? I think the worst thing is just how, um, it's just the cost, right? Like yeah. all of this is an opportunity cost. And I think what you come to realize, not really in med school, because like particularly now that so much of it is like, choose your own adventure. Like yeah. you guys decide when you want to go through these lectures. Like in a given week, how many things do you have to be at? Like, maybe six right now, hours of joke. stuff. I'm doing nothing. Yeah, like me, like when you're in the preclinical setting, like you have so much of your time that you can dictate. Yeah. And then when you become a resident, like your your time is just not your own mm-hmm. anymore. And I think the opportunity cost of that is huge because it yeah. is our most finite resource. Yeah. And you miss a lot in those years in terms of like the time that you get to spend with your family, the time you get to spend with your friends. You just, um, you miss out on a lot of big things in a lot of people's lives. And, I, and I, it, that's that's tough. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's huge, and and I think that's the important thing because money, these things will come, but time is something we can't really, we can't really There's get. There's no back. bank for that. That is unidirectional. That is, it's <laughs> so. Let's say, regardless of the, we we like the good things about being a surgeon. Yeah. And we want to be a surgeon. What are the characteristics characteristics of someone who would excel in surgery? Would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it requires like, like a. A real intellect, right? Like you have to be curious um, and like very thoughtful. You're having to download such a profound amount of information like in your brain, like in general surgery, because we see such a wide variety of pathology and are expected to know so much about so many disease states that you have to have like a real curiosity um, and then like have the energy while you're in training and working these crazy hours to like pursue that intellect and really want to understand these things. I think that's the most important thing. Like a lot of, yeah. you know, people who are more advanced than I will, will talk about like the technical aspect of it. And sometimes med students get to the OR and like, it's it's so <laughs> stressful, right? Like we literally like wrap you in a gown, like put a mask on you, like put you in, in gloves, like stress you out for two and a half hours, three hours, don't let you eat or drink or like go to the bathroom. And then we're like, okay, you have like, three minutes to sew this skin back together perfectly. <laughs> so we just like set you up for like this this ridiculous situation. And then we're like, okay, close the skin, you know? And like, everybody's watching you. The scrub tech, anesthesia's like trying to decide how much more anesthetic to give. Minutes. And like, and it's just, it's just absolutely the worst. So the point I was trying to make is that like, a lot of med students get there and like they're, they're, they're having this profound stress response, right? And their hands are shaking and like they're dripping sweat. <laughs> And I think a lot of people walk away from that and they're like, I can't possibly be a surgeon, right? And that's just like the completely wrong way for us to like go about all of this. And like, there is, there are some people who like technically it's, it is a leap too far, like for them to go into surgery. But that is like a strong, like strong, far curve, right? Like most everybody if you want to, and if you practice a lot, like you will have the dexterity and the technical skill you need to do a general surgery residency. But I think a lot of people walk away from that exactly something like this experience you described, maybe not that much 
Um, and they're just like, I don't think I can do this. Yeah. And I don't, I, I wish we could keep people from having that experience yeah. and letting that impact whether they choose a surgical yeah. subspecialty or not. Yeah. Because it all like, like your meta like all of it changes so much. Like as you do it more, it's like everything yeah. else, right? Yeah. Like how stressful is it the first time you try to snowboard, right? Like yeah, it's you're crazy. like, I'm going to hit a tree and I'm going to die. Like, yeah. You're like yeah. confident, right? But it's just like everything. Like humans are very good at like learning things and adapting to things. And if you sit there every night and you like throw a thousand knots and you practice suturing, like you will get very good at it. Yeah. To be clear, I, I loved the experience. I loved yeah. my surgery experience. And they'd ask me before I the place of sutures, they're like, you're going to do it? And I always say yes, right? I never yeah. say, no, I don't. I want to watch it one more time. I always say yes and go for it because it is a great feeling. Yeah. I don't know. It's a feeling of importance when the, when the scrub tech's handing you something. Totally. And they're like helping you out. And you're like, wait yeah. a second, I'm a third year medical student. It was just, and when it actually works and they don't pull out the stitch and redo it for you, it's like, yeah. it's like a, an amazing an amazing experience. And it, and it keeps going, right? Yeah. Like, that's like, that. I have that same experience constantly, yeah. right? Where, like, I'm not, I'm trying to decide if I feel like I have the confidence to do the next step of a case mm -hmm. constantly. And knowing your risk threshold and knowing the surgeon who you're operating with risk threshold and calibrating all of that and deciding when it's safe for you to, like, push and try to do more of the case and do the next step of the case and yep. throw like a really difficult stitch on a bleeding vein, you know, or things like that. That's like the art of being like a mid senior level resident and like knowing when to push yourself and knowing when to step back is something that I think we all work on every day. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a profound challenge and that feeling that you're describing like never totally goes away. Like yeah. it gets okay. modulated, but like you're, we still all every day are looking for that space where we are feeling technically challenged, where we're feeling that like, we have to do this perfectly. Yeah. And we know that if we do it right, we're going to feel amazing. Yeah. And like, it's the, it's what the patient needs. Yeah. So I think it's, I, it's an important experience like to have, yeah. like as a med student, um, the most important thing is that we do it safely. Right. Yeah, and like course, people yeah, don't yeah. wake up from anesthesia and like injure themselves yeah. <laughs> and like wounds get closed, like safely and well. This guy but, had no idea what was going on. He didn't remember yeah, it at all. And it was yeah, fine. Of course, yeah. my stitches were perfect. We're of not going to check are. them, but they were perfect. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't, anyway, I think I, I wish I could tell people that like, just cause you didn't like that experience in that moment. And just cause you didn't feel like you had the technical skill in that moment that you would need to be a general surgery resident yeah. that has nothing to do with whether you'd be good at this specialty or yeah. not. Yeah. 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 No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Let's widen out. Let's step, let's take, like take a little bit of a step back here. In the life of being a, going through medical school, being a surgeon, just the general life that you've led. Do you have any general advice for being, I guess, maybe happier, more successful, whatever successful means in regards to, this could be anything, lifestyle, finances, uh, career, um, anything that you've learned kind of along, because you've been going through this for like, <laughs> may, not I've, I'm about halfway through you, yeah. but you've been going through it for a while, right? Anything you wish you knew, anything you wish someone told you, and it doesn't have to be surgery, right? It could be something as simple as, I remember another doctor said, uh, you know, I just made sure to go for a walk every weekend, like, because yeah. like, because he just loved doing that. Um, anything. I think I continue to be impressed by the extent to which, like, you, what you throw out to the universe is just going to reverberate back Got to it. you. You know, and I think that, like, so many people are so stressed out and demands are so high in academic medicine at big hospitals that it's very easy to show up and like be like just in like a tough place mentally. And I think like, I'm like coming out of, of a week of, of being on nights as the trauma chief. Wow. And like there, you know, there was one night this week where I like showed up and I like wasn't at a hundred percent. Like I was just like a little bit frustrated, like a little bit more tired than I wanted to be. And the way you move through the world, maybe without even realizing it, is going to just amplify that and make it harder and make it harder. And the place I really realized this was like in India. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there doing research in global surgery. And like, I was amazed the extent to which Mumbai, but also the country more broadly, like when you are in a place that has that much energy and that much going on all around you all the time, the only other place in the world I've been like it is Cairo, which is just a massive city, a polluted city. And what you threw, what I would throw out to the universe when I was walking around in Mumbai and like trying to get stuff done on a research project just echoed back at me. Like if I smiled like at India, like metaphorically, yeah. things could happen. 
But the moment I like dug in or I was frustrated, like it all just would collapse down on yeah. you, you know? Yeah. And I think that you have a real job when you're leading a team in medicine to show up with the best energy you can every day. And Gary Rosato was a, one of the most incredible people I've ever met. He was a surgeon at Jefferson and he, um, he died unfortunately about 18 months ago of a glioblastoma. Mm. And like, he still has such a footprint on the place and like all of us who trained with him and his ability to show up to clinic, to show up in the middle of the night for an operation that was emergent. He didn't want to do to show up and round on patients who weren't sure they were ready to go home and just completely inspire them like with his confidence and with his enthusiasm, I will never forget it. Yeah. And if you can show up on those days when it's really hard and like bring it and be excited to teach and be excited to learn and be excited to do a case that you deep down like wish was a different kind of case, that echoes back to you. Yeah. And I wish I had realized that sooner and I'm like trying to get better at it now, but it's just a skill and it's like any skill and you have to develop it. And so I wish I, I wish I had figured that out a little bit earlier. Yeah. It reminds me of what you said earlier, the lean into everything. I think that's yeah. a great thing. I was even talking to someone the other week and I just stole your, I already yeah. stole your phrase. Yeah. I was it's like, not my, you just got to lean in. I think it's a Sheryl Sandberg thing. I don't know. But I think it's, it's she wrote a book. She was a CEO of Facebook and like, I have to admit to not like reading it, but that was like the mantra of that, of her narrative. Um, so yeah, I think I, it, I just, I found that so much. Um, and I wish I knew that a little bit earlier. Otherwise, I would say, like, do the hard thing you don't want to do. Just do it. Like, we all have these things that, like, we are dreading, whether it's, like, a certain research project or studying a certain part of physiology. And, like, if you can get up in the morning and just get that thing done, everything else is so much easier. I found that mornings are absolutely sacred. Like, your brain is just firing on such a higher level. There's this weird transition, I think, like, in your early 20s where you like a lot of people have gone from like doing all their work at night when they were in college to like then they're a med student and they're a little bit older and like the sooner you can pivot to like realizing how clear your thought is in the morning and figuring out like which tasks you want to do in that space i think it can be really helpful for your productivity like a lot like almost every yeah. serious writer i know it's like the morning yeah like hemingway or somebody talked about how they, it felt like there's like this thin film on his brain mm. and like he would try to get as much done as he could before that like started to fall apart. Cause wow. after that, like the writing sucked, you know? Yeah. And I think, um, that's, that is something I've found like really valuable. Yeah. It's like, just get up, do the hard thing, no matter how much you dread it. And I almost like, I'll try to set, like set myself up for that. Like the night before, you know what I mean? Like what's the angle, right? So when I was writing, I would like know what I wanted to write, what I wanted to start with the next morning. So I wouldn't get up and be like, should I do this section? Should I do this section? Should I transcribe this? I just like knew like I, this was what I was going to start with because this was the hard thing that I didn't really want to do. And you knock that out. And I think it just a day can flow from there really well. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think there is some evidence that shows kind of, and this makes sense, right? When you first wake up, your levels of cortisol, epinephrine, okay. dopamine are like, are like much higher than they are throughout the it rest of the day. It has to be biochemical. Yeah. Like yeah. It's too, it works too well <laughs> to be anything other than biochemically mitigated. So you're talking about, do sorry, what was his name? Dr. Glee Oda? That you, inspired you that was in the clinic recently. Oh, Gary Rosato is Dr. Gary Rosato. Yeah. So he's like our lounge at Jefferson, like yeah. the resident lounge is like named after like him. And Amazing. Yeah, he, he was a really special, special general surgeon and uh, yeah, figure like in Philadelphia surgery, like his whole, yeah. he's like sort of a surgical legacy. Yeah. So he's, he seems to have inspired you and kind of put a good kind of note on you for surgery and things like that. Do you have any other characteristics or any other attendings? Uh, you don't have to say specific names or anything like that that you look up to? And are there certain things about them that you look up to? Like, I want to have a career like this guy because he's always happy when he shows up to clinic or yeah. he knows he's he's the most technically skilled surgeon I've ever met yeah. in my entire life. Is there anyone yeah. like that? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of them, you know, and I think you're constantly trying to do that in your training. It's like pull things from different people. Yeah. And like, there's a lot of she's too. Like, yeah. There's a lot. Like Dr. Chinaki, our program director, is an outstanding teacher in the OR and um, an incredibly gifted like general surgeon, foregut surgeon. And I very much strive to like emulate her as an OR teacher. Um, Dr. Yo, who's like one of the foremost HPB surgeons around, like his, uh, his poise in the OR is like truly remarkable. And there's like a cadence when you operate with him um, that, that like I will definitely seek to emulate. He's also one of these people who has 
structured his his day in such a meaningful way that like everything just sort of flows and unfolds and like everyone who's helping him in the OR, everyone who's working with him like on the administrative side, they just like know how to make it all move mm -hmm. and be as efficient as possible. Um, Dr. Maley is like a, a pretty renowned uh, abdominal transplant surgeon here at Jeff. And he is, um, you know, the thing that people talk about with him is just like his, his true creativity. Like you'll get in, you can get in very difficult situations reconstructing um, like damaged, you know, vasculature and people with bad disease who need, you know, reconstructions and shunts and things like this. And he like, he looks at problems in just this like kind of profound creative way. Um, Dr. Okasanya is just like amazing. He's like great. he's, he's a great surgeon. He's another one of those people like Dr. Rosado who like yeah. fundamentally changes the room when he yeah. walks in. Right. And he changes what patients think is possible, change what residents think is possible. Um, and that, that totally inspires me. Nate Evans is like the division chief for thoracic surgery. And he thinks more clearly than I think any human I've ever met. Like I, you wake the guy up at two or 3 AM and he's like, He's like, obviously, like you do this, this, do yeah. this, this, and this. And you're like, how, like, how did you get there already? Um, that's like, it's like top tier Jedi powers. And I definitely aspire to that. That's awesome. Um, who else? There's, there's, there's just so many like Dr. Glorioso is another one of the transplant surgeons. And she has this ability that I've really sought to like, um, like develop in myself, which is that we have this thing. I think a lot of times when we're like trying to teach people in the OR where we're like on top of them like physically, like staring at their hands, like right up next to them. And I think for a lot of people, like all they need is like a little bit of space. Yeah. Like they just need to feel like they can breathe and like think about it and just like throw the stitch, you know? And she, ha she has this incredible ability to like let you, I think, be better than you are in some ways because she's just like, she just sets you up. She's just Steps like, back. all right, cool. Here's the anastomosis. Like, you know, where do you like, where do you want to put the stitch? Like, go do it, you yeah. know? Um, and like a lot of times when people are correcting you or they're like saying they want you to take more tissue or less tissue, there's like this like subtle like tension and frustration in their voices. And she mm -hmm. just has like none of that. That's amazing. It's truly amazing. And like, I, I hope to be able to do that too, yeah. like as a teacher, because it just doesn't make people perform any better. Like when they feel like you are stressed out, it yeah. just be, turns into this like cycle, I think for a lot of people. Yeah. Regarding other residents, do you see... And again, definitely don't say specific names in this one. But yeah. do you see any common mistakes that residents kind of going through their general surgery career make? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like, I, I feel like I've made as many mistakes yeah, as Yeah, say your mistakes. Right, as like, as yeah, like, I think that um, that's just the nature of the beast, right? Yeah. Is that, like, you're going to make mistakes. One of the people at Vermont, I'll never, we did, like, a, you know, a senior surgery major, like, seminar yeah. kind of thing. And she's she's an awesome vascular surgeon and super smart and has spent a lot of time like working with residents. And she said, I think there's kind of like two cohorts of people. Like yeah. there's one group who really thrive as interns and they like can just manage it all. Like this profound information flow and like keeping all of these ducks in line for all these patients. And then they become like more senior residents and like it's really hard for them to delegate and to like let their hands off having all that control. And she's like, there's another group who like struggles interns with like all that information flow. But then when they're sort of relieved of like having to do like all of the order sets and all of the things and they have a little more time to like think and analyze and do stuff like they really thrive in that space when they're a little bit more senior and i i i come back to that a lot and i think it's it's not a perfect model but there's some like truth mm -hmm. to it and so i think you have to really in residency like know thyself and know which set of those things you are and like know your weaknesses so if you're one of these people that's like an awesome intern and can just manage it and can just manage it all then when you move into that two and three role, like you may not like do super well interacting mm -hmm. with people from the other cohort. And I think that can be challenging, you know? Um, at the same time, if you're one of those interns who like are just overwhelmed by all of it, particularly at the beginning, that's dangerous and hard too, you know? So I think the biggest thing is just to recognize where, where you feel, where you're not, meeting the mark as Got a it. resident. And one of the things that's hard in academic medicine is we're not particularly good at feedback a lot of times. Yeah. Like we just kind of get frustrated with each other instead of it being like a really structured thing where we're like, okay, this is what you're doing wrong. This is how you get better at it. Like it's still like in some ways like this little bit antiquated apprenticeship thing where it's just like, we tell you you messed up. We're a little bit frustrated with you. We expect you to do it right next time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like, 
you've siphoned such a talented group of people that for the most part that works. But there are some people who need just like a much more thorough remediation and system. Um, and it, that exists like in varying degrees to different places, yeah. I think. But I think it's one place in general that, that like a lot of institutions like need work. Got it. But, you know, I think it's also up against like just the stresses of the modern American healthcare system and like the fact we got a lot of people who like need healthcare and we need to like get them through. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really helpful and things to think about. Stepping back even more, if you could speak to year one medical school, Brian Till, would you give him any advice? Would you tell him anything? Yeah, absolutely. I would, um, I would spend that time. Yeah. You know, it's difficult cause I had to work so hard as a med student cause I'm like dyslexic and mm -hmm. just like absorbing information is so much harder for me than a lot of people who like are like super smart and in this space. Mm -hmm. But, I think you're super smart. Thanks, man. Space, I yeah. appreciate it. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of med students have so much time and they have so much sovereignty over their time. And I would really go back and challenge myself to try to um, develop like a robust skill set for research, like in those first couple of years. Yeah. And so I've had a bunch of first year med students on with me this week. They like randomly come in and like spend a first night. First year med yeah, students. Yeah, I don't know when they started. They spend a night with you? Yeah. So they come in it's and they like just kids. like, yeah, it's been so fun. They like come in and they're just like, all right, we're here for a night on trauma, you know? And so some like, some like, I mean, you know, in the they past in couple stuff? months, yeah, like, so we like, they must have never scrubbed in either before. They've never, they? they've never scrubbed in, like, they've never seen any of this stuff. Like, some of them have like barely been in a hospital. So it's like and a really, seen it's a really, blood before in their life. Yeah. And then they come in and like, we're opening chests yeah. and like the ER or like at the bedside, we're doing X laps at the bedside. Like, we're running like a busy, complex service. And like, it's, um, it's very interesting to watch them like watching us. How do they react? Know? Some of them like, some of them were like, can I like come back? To really? Or like some of them were just like, I, wow. can I stay forever? And you're like, no, you got to go finish Sleep, med school. Yeah. <laughs> but eventually, like you can come in a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't, I tell them all that, like hit me up anytime. Yeah. I'm happy to have you. Like you That's can come nice. like hang out and follow me around whatever rotation I'm on. So in that time and space that you have, um, I really wish I had like taken the plunge and just like learned Stata or Python or any of them, you know? I think you become invaluable in medical school and residency and as a junior attending in academic medicine when you can do your own analyses. Like when you can get some money, buy the data set um, and produce meaningful research yeah. from it. You know, yeah. all of this ultimately comes back to like, what can you prove? Yeah. So I can make all the policy recommendations I want and tell you all of the things I think about different types of residents and mentalities and skill sets and what that means. But like in the world that we inhabit in academic medicine, until you can like prove it and show some yeah. data, nothing's starting. Like nobody's going anywhere with it, you know? So I think if I went back, I would be like, congratulations, YouTube has been developed. <laughs> this is what you do. You need to sit down with a basic data set and just learn how to do these things, you know, learn how to do basic descriptive statistics, learn how to do basic regressions, learn how to do propensity match, like figure this out. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've, um, I'm, I did a lot of that last year. Um, and I, I, I'm lucky to have had the time to do it, but like, it would have been awesome to spend last year, like doing, you know, much more advanced stuff yeah. than that. Right. Like taking that basic skill set and turning it into something. That's interesting. Advice, even more and I, creative. Think, I don't think something I've heard from anyone ever. Yeah. So, so I told, really, so, yeah. I, so that was one of the things I talked about with like a bunch of them that were on with me this week. And like, it just feels so daunting, right? We're cracking the chest now, but you open your computer up as well. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah. Let's get you. <laughs> let me send you. Let me send you some code. Like I think it's just, um, you know, it's one of these things where again, like, what are we doing in American healthcare? We expect everybody to be participating in research. Like we expect everyone to be asking important questions and yielding research that can help us deliver better care. But like, are we really teaching people how to do it? Yeah. Like we're really not. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. I don't know why that is like we, it's hard for us to at once be saying like data and understanding literature and producing literature is essential to the enterprise of you being a doctor. Yeah. But we're not actually going to buy subscriptions to data licensing yeah. and bring in st statisticians to yeah. teach you these skill sets in a meaningful way. It's tough. Like what is that? that that's such a disconnect. I think it's a like, dis and again, you, I think you're much more well-read on these subjects than I am, but I think the, the trouble is where's the incentive? You know what I mean? What do you mean? For the like, med schools? For, so if you're a med student and the yeah. med, so if, if you're just a med student, right? Yeah. And you don't have access to these software, 
totally. and you're not interested in yeah. a really competitive specialty or doing something crazy, where's the incentive to do research and learn these things? Yeah. Especially if you, the impetus is, you know, you have to do these extra steps and maybe even pay money totally. to learn it. And it's not a yeah. required course or anything. It's, it's I tough. Can, I, yeah, I totally hear you. I think my sense is that with step one going away, yeah. like one step, two scores are going to get much more important, but two, like there's going to be a lot of pressure to be like, okay, like what's yeah. your academics look like? So more than, I only actually started thinking about this because of med students like coming to our research group and like just like sidelining me and being like, hey, like I really feel like I need to be more productive. Like how do I go about this? Yeah. And that's when I started realizing like well, we are just like not in making this easy. Like there's like, like are you really going to shell out thousands of dollars for a, a subscription to like one of these services? And it's just, anyway, it's an, it's one of these disconnects. I wish in med school in retrospect, like where I went, there was pretty good resources. Like I think yeah. I could have gotten like a data license like out of the med school. There's definitely data I could have worked with. Um, but it felt like such a massive undertaking that like I just cognitively wasn't there for me and there was no support system for it. So I didn't like run down that road. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought and I think something that would benefit because imagine how different you are when you go through residency applications and stuff like that. If you know yeah. all these codes and you can show projects or yourself on a website or something You're, like that, it'd You be are huge. like a fundamentally different applicant. Yeah. And it's the same thing when you go to an attending and you're like, hey, I want to do research. And you're like, I don't really know how to do stats. I can like do a lit review for you. Like I can like write a paper. When you show up and you're like, here are like three manuscripts that I've done. They're basic statistics. These are, this is what I'm trying to learn. I know this is the data you use. I'd really like to start learning how to use that yeah. data set. That's like such a different conversation. And it's something that'll take you far. I think you're going to be so using far. it for the rest of your career, right? For, literally for the rest of the year. Like Even once if you, you leave you can and do go to industry, I mean, it's still... It, yeah. it, it, I, I just don't... So if I could go back and talk to junior yeah. me, I would say yeah. that. I don't think every med student needs to do that. Yeah. I think it would behoove us like as a specialty and as med schools to yeah. like, if we are going to say that data and evidence-based medicine is our gospel, mm -hmm to start like putting our money where our mouth is yeah. a little bit. Because you do like people say like as you start like developing skill sets and like working with the data, you start to understand how to ask questions in a little bit different way. And you start to understand like why you might trust or not trust yeah. other papers in this whole new way. And so I think that itself is valuable too as like somebody who's sitting back taking in the data. Yeah. The more of it you like start to learn how to do, I think the more of it colors how you look at different research. There's even another level of importance because we go into medicine, when we start practicing medicine, what are we doing? We're looking at evidence and we're yep. basing our practice off evidence. But if we don't understand how the evidence is made and we don't understand when evidence is significant or yeah. not significant, then this might even alter patient care, right? Which is totally. huge. Uh, absolutely. Like, I mean, in theory, everything we're doing should be evidence-based and yeah. like all of it should come back to the literature. And so I, anyway, that's just like yeah. kind of a tangent and put something I've been it's thinking about a little bit. And I think it's, impo it's important as well. And I think yeah. it's a skill that'll help you out. So I would definitely tell myself that, like, just, just suck it up, like find somebody, sit at their feet, like learn to code. Um, and I would tell myself, so I had, a, I had a big debate about like, do I try to go do a residency like at a big place that has a ton of operative volume or do I, you know, go somewhere that's like a little bit slower paced, um, less complex cases. And I had a lot of mentors who like really were like, go, you want to be somewhere that's doing as much and as complex of surgery as you can get your hands on. And I took that advice, but like, I took it like, like a little bit, not sure it was the right call. Yeah. It was the right decision. Yeah. And I would go back and be like, stay on that track. Yeah. Don't change your mind. What is Don't the waffle. reasoning behind this decision? It's just like you, I mean, it's the more you see, the better you're going to be. Yeah. The more you do, the better you're going to be. Yeah. And it is ultimately about taking care of as many sick people as you can so that when your patients down the road are sick, like you have this sickle set to deal with them and then getting the most technically challenging training you can get. Right. So there's just an echelon of how difficult surgeries are, you know, right. and the more time you spend on like the really hard side of that spectrum, the better. So if you go to a place that has like really technically demanding surgery, but like it's all being done by like fellows and super fellows, like have you really benefited? Yeah. Probably not. If you go to a place that has a ton of really technically demanding surgery, but like you're there and you're right. the first assist, you're like getting a really good experience. If you go to that place and you're not the first assist, but you're the one like leading the operations, that's the best possible scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's, re it's really hard as an applicant to tease out like, what are those places? Like, yeah. what is the operative experience? Like you get, you go to these interviews and 
every intern's going to be like, oh, I've done 80 cases already this year, right? And it's like, but what does that look like? Like, yeah. are you doing a gallbladder and like you're leading the dissection? Like you're teasing out like a really inflamed cystic duct from all the other structures in the gallbladder? Like it's it's really, really hard to tease out and it's an applicant. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't envy those folks trying to like do that right now on the interview trail. Zoom. Yeah, trying to do it on Zoom, right? But um, as best you can, like I would say lean on your alumni, right? Like I reached out to a lot of alumni of my med school who were in surgical training and said, hey, you don't know me, but I'm applying. I'd love to pick your brain about your program and other ones you interviewed at. And that was really helpful information. Yeah. Jefferson's got a lot of graduates who are in whatever, medicine, psych, neuro, wherever you want to be. So I think I would encourage people to just just shoot emails into space, man. The worst thing that happens is they don't answer, yeah, right? I shoot tons of emails into you space. You shoot tons of emails. I've shot tons of emails, right? Like for both of us, it's led to cool stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. And you have to, and the per value of persistence, I think, is something that's undervalued too. Totally. I mean, it's. I don't think anyone's been annoyed with me and like stopped sending emails. They're usually like, sorry, I've just been so busy. I couldn't send yeah, emails. No, I mean, yeah. that's like, that's another, like, I think we talked about this briefly yeah. last time. It's like, the information flow that you're dealing with, like as an attending, is just so massive. Like a non-response usually just means like, I'm busy. It doesn't yeah. mean no. It just means like I am cognitively so overloaded that I can't, I have to triage this right now. Yeah. And if you catch them like 36 hours later, it may be a totally different thing. Yeah. It may be like, absolutely, let's set this up. And, and you have um, experience in this elsewhere, right? I want to, I want to step aside a little bit. How do you get an interview with Bill Clinton? Yeah. How do you do that? So that, so I, so I did this book where I interviewed a bunch of old presidents and I was basically like, why is my generation staring down the same set of challenges that the post-Cold War generation was staring down? It doesn't really feel like you guys got the ball down the Did field. a book. I just want to clarify yeah. for the audience. You wrote and published yeah. a book, which is insane. Yeah. That's amazing. It was, a, it was an awesome experience. Um, and, you know, that, that question of like, how did you find these people with the exception of a couple of them, like Clinton... And Gorbachev, I think those are really the only two. The rest of the, the rest of the other ones are like, they're just retired. Yeah. Right. They're just like sitting around, which was part of what I was after. Right. Like I wanted people who were not bound by the constraints of like the next election or trying to get their like, you know, successor reelected and just be like, can we talk about like yeah. this experience of power and like what you could accomplish and what you couldn't and like, where do we go from here? Um, so a lot of them, it was just like, find their foundation, find their press office, talk to those folks and set it up. And An then, email or is it a call? Yeah, email, phone calls, yeah. just all the typical stuff. And then like half the time you get there and they sit down and they're like, cool, who are you? Like, what are we doing? You know, like they don't know. They just like, they have people they that handle their stuff. They yeah, up. they're like retired people enjoying their lives and like they're happy to do Do you interviews. lead with anything? Like I'm, I've written for XYZ. Yeah, or totally. Like you just tell them who you are, you know? Yeah. So like I told them, I, at that point I was writing like a syndicated column and I was, you know, associated with this think tank and, say I'm working on this project, these are the other folks I've interviewed, I'm happy to share like the chapters from those folks to give you a sense of what I'm looking for. These are the things I want to talk about. Um, and like some, like they have, there's like, there's a, something called the Club de Madrid, which is a ton of former heads of state that get together like every year. And so I got like, you know, three or four or five really of my favorite wow. interviews like within 10 days of each other just hanging out in Madrid with them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like everything else. You just yeah. got to ask, right? Yeah. Like you're shocked what you can accomplish in this life if you just ask, you know? Um, and Bill Clinton and Gorbachev, well, they were different in a way. They're, you know, they are truly like mythical kind of global yeah. figures, right? Um, so Gorbachev, I chased forever. Like he was really hard. So I went through his um, his uh, translator. Like I found uh, Gorbachev's speaking agent in the U.S. and he does like a lot of speeches or he yeah. did, he passed in the last year. Um, and so I, I got to him and he said, you know, this guy is his longtime translator and he's really his like closest handler and he'd be the person to engage with. And mm. so I went literally, I probably like, I went to Virginia, I went to Texas. Like I like follow him Actually around. literally chasing him. Like literally chasing him. And like every time it was like, good to see you. We'll set this up. We'll set this up. We'll set this up. I ended up at my book deadline in Moscow, like in like October of, I don't even know what year it was. And I was like, Mikhail Sergeyevich, like I'm here. I have like 18 hours left on my visa. In Moscow. In you Moscow. went to Moscow. Yeah. And he, and it's hilarious. And I, so I'm sitting there like, like not, sh I, so I, I asked the people, I was like, what happens if I run over this visa? Like, well, like, I don't know if I'm going to get them today. I think I can get them tomorrow. And they were all like, oh, you can't do that. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I can't do that. Like people overstay their visas all the time. They're like, if you do that, you'll go to the airport. They will 
like stamp your passport, not let you on a plane and not tell you what to do. And so then you're just like lost in the Russian bureaucracy. What? I don't know if it's true. But that's what like people who I trust who had like helped me get to that point told me. So I was like, all right, well, today's the day. Like I got to just go and be like, can we please sit down and do this? Yeah. And so and for like, like I was there for like four or five days. And he, at that point in his life, he'd wake up every morning, take his blood pressure. And if his blood pressure was too high, he just like wouldn't go into the foundation. So I knew he had to go into the foundation this day because he had like an event. And so I basically just was like, hey, like, it's great to see you again. If you have an hour, like, I would love to sit down and talk yeah. with you. And he was like, we'll do this. And like, we went and we sat and we talked and it was like. It's amazing. Thank God. What do you like, like to At talk that to? point, like the whole book was done. And it was like, it was like this arch that was like wrapped around like the fall of the Soviet yeah. Union. Like a lot of the stuff was about like, like Vaclav, ha Vaclav Havel, who I, who I interviewed, like led the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. Mm. And he's this playwright and this poet and this beautiful man and this beautiful life. And like, you know, uh, just uh, so many of these interviews sort of like built to this like discussion of the Cold War and how that shaped the world. Like the clerk in South Africa, wow. the guy who ended apartheid and shared the Nobel Prize with Nelson Mandela and like nobody remembers. The only person in the world to take a full nuclear program and totally dismantle it. I didn't know that. And it, like, so all of it, like it was that, like so much of what South Africa was capable of and his constraints were shaped by the Cold War at that point. And so all of it like hinged on like this like inflection of like Gorbachev being like this sort of mid late chapter in the book. And so like I was like, I have no idea what I'm gonna do if I don't get this interview. And so like thank God it worked out. It was it was And stressful. he was nice when he talked to you. Yeah, he's super, I mean, he's a very tough guy to yeah. interview because he's like, you know, he's he's a creature of the Soviet system, right? Mm -hmm. He was a guy who should have never been allowed to be president for like numerous reasons. But he was so, so smart. Like you can go back and read a lot about like the discussions like in the Politburo. Yeah. And he at that point was surrounded by just like these ancient folks. Like they had burned through like three or four people in quick succession who had just like become Soviet premier, died, become Soviet premier and died. And like to the point where Reagan was like, how do I get anywhere with these negotiations? They just keep dying. Like we can't get anywhere. You know, he was so masterful in his ability to weave Soviet ideology and like the realities on the ground that everybody it was just indisputable to people like everybody in the political system traveled like they would go to italy they mm -hmm. would go to canada they would go to these conferences and they could see like what that looked like compared to like what was happening in terms of russia right and this managed economy and so his ability to like weave those two things together and make arguments for change was just exceptional right yeah. um but like he he accomplished that by being a creature of the system and that wasn't like a discussion-based system. That yeah. was like you speak you and it. speak and speak and speak until everybody else is tired and they sort of agree with you and like you give up and like, all right, let's go. Like we're done with this meeting. And so he's a really tough, he was a, he's a really tough guy to interview also because you have to wait for the translation. So like it just eats up a ton of time. Yeah. But it was awesome. It like, it was useful. People who, you know, studied him like well were like that. That's like a very like good interview. Like you got good stuff out of him. I found it like, I felt like it sort of brought the book together well. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. It's I mean, it's stunning. It's it's amazing the effort and the success yeah. that you've had yeah. with this. It's really really cool. It was and really, it's really fun. different. It was really fun, and you know, for the rest of them, they were like Clinton was awesome. Like, They're like cool. It's like me. Like when yeah. can we set it up, and then Clinton, um, he's another one. So he like um, they like threatened to sue me. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It got a little ugly. Can you talk about this? Yeah, I think so. I don't. I don't need <laughs> at this point. Like, what's the matter? So they like are. He's incredibly guarded um, in terms of like who gets access, who does interviews and stuff. And they really only let like things, um, things in that they think are going to be favorable. Yeah. And like, they like insist on like seeing everything. So it's a book of edited transcripts. So mm -hmm. I was like willing to let them review the transcript. They didn't make any changes. I didn't show them the introduction to the chapter and the introduction. I like talk about, I talk pretty candidly about like Monica Lewinsky yeah. and like sort of like, you know, the legacy of Bill Clinton and they like lost their minds. And so the Atlantic published a bunch of like the excerpts to, yeah. from the book, like on their website. And so when that went up, they went like nuts. So like season to sit, like, like no, like just like lo emails from lawyers and like all of this stuff. And like, dude, we just kind of, I just kind of wrote it out. And my publisher was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, what can I do? Like yeah. it's printed in a book and like it's out there in the Thank world. God like, you have them behind you, right? Otherwise, yeah, I mean, I think, what you, I think what you come to realize is like, it's just all noise. Yeah. It's all noise. Like, well, like at the end of the day, there's like a tape recording that I can play and like the rest of it's my opinion. Yeah. And like, I'm sorry, my opinion upsets you. I'm yeah. sorry, the facts of your presidency upset yeah. you, but like, 
you don't get to sue me over that. Yeah, no. If it's you know? if it's facts and it, it's you can't you can't get in trouble for that, right? This is the these are the laws yeah. of you know libel and slander and all this kind. So of So anyway, that was an experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's that's amazing. <laughs> and then last thing on the book, because I because I want to step off of it. Uh, how do you write a book? Do you like propose yeah. something? Do you like totally. write a thing and then you get some publishers yeah, yeah. and you send it to them? So fiction and nonfiction is super different. For fiction books, you really got to write the whole thing. Yeah, they want to see like everything. Yeah. Um, and then for uh, this is like for debut stuff. Yeah. And then for nonfiction, you really don't. Like, yeah. You need a couple chapters in a book proposal and you need an agent. Yeah. And, um, you know, you sort of like, you have to make the argument really why you're the person to write it, Got you it. know? And so if you have whatever following on social media, whatever articles in that space previously, whatever background in your life that predisposes you to tell that story and you write a compelling couple chapters, it used to be, 10 years ago when I was doing this, that like you could sell that book pretty easily. Mm. Um, the price point really depended on your audience, like mm -hmm. how much you know notoriety you had in your command of the subject and how interesting they thought the subject was. I have no idea what that looks yeah. like now. Like print, the print industry is in such decay and yeah. it's such a nightmare now that I have no idea yeah. if that's still true. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing. Two more questions, then we'll let you get to sleep. And uh, yeah, because how? Because do you see my eyes? How, like, no, 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 no. How much did you sleep last night? This, I think this probably, is interesting. Probably a couple hours. A couple hours, and yeah. you were on the trauma service last night. Yeah, it was nice and not insane. So yeah. you know, usually you sort of come in and you run the list on all the patients. Um, usually there's like one or two traumas who are like in limbo still. Yeah. You're like waiting for scans to be read and stuff like that. Usually there's one or two people in the OR. Yeah. So you like bump out the person who's in the OR. If they're, if, you know, you go see the people who are like tenuous or decompensating yeah. and get kind of a baseline on them, decide if you want to do something or if you're just going to kind of ride it out for a while. And then you see what the night throws yeah. at you. So usually like by the time, you know, midnight or so rolls around, if nothing's happening, yeah. um, you can like kind of sneak in yeah. some sleep and then you, but it's, you know, I'd say like we're a busy enough hospital that like one out of five nights you actually get to sleep. Yeah. Two out of five Finish nights you get like an yeah. hour or two. But then you got to wake up, like, because you yeah. got labs. You, like, undoubtedly have somebody here, like, yeah. let's check another set of labs. Yeah. Somebody whose belly you want to push on. Yeah. Sometimes they call you and they say they're opening a chest in the CVICU and they yeah. want you to come help. You know, it's just, yeah. you never know what's going to happen. No, that's, that's, but, that, well, thank you again for coming in. I really, really no, appreciate pleasure. it. And yeah. then two questions, then we'll get you out of here. Because you're so well-read, you're a writer, you're, you know, you've been done all these amazing things. Do you have any recommendations for medical students, a book they should read? And it doesn't have to be healthcare oriented or anything like that. I remember some pe some books people have said, you know, is House of God yeah. or When Breath Becomes Air. Are there any books that you think all medical students or all people in healthcare should read? Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm so not well read anymore. Yeah. I used to be such a fantastic reader and I got to do a little bit again during my research year. But I miss it. Yeah. Like if I get my hundred million dollars from yeah. you, like I'm going to spend it. so much more time like just reading like just that's one of all these presents I interviewed. It was amazing how many of them said like, "You need space. You need time and space," and they will fill up your calendar like beyond beyond what's possible. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have time away to like read and read history and just think about the problems in front of you, like you will be stifled in your ability to be a leader. Um, so I miss like. It tremendously. I miss reading The Economist. I miss reading The New Yorker. I miss reading The Atlantic. Like, it hurts. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think when um, when Breath Becomes Air is a beautiful book. Yeah. And I think it, like, if you can read that book and not cry, like, yeah. you guys should get checked out. Yeah. Like, we no, should, no. We should send you through the psych unit for a second and just kick the tires. Um, I think that is, a, is a, like, a beautiful book. I think... Um, House of God is one of these things that's like seminal and it's like, there's a quote out there that like, it's not a good book, but it's an important book. Mm -hmm. And I think for people who don't know medicine at all, like the absurdity of it is captured there, right? Yeah. Like you like do not believe, like sometimes I tell people I went into medicine, like for the content, like for the stories, right? Like it's just truly incredible. Like yeah. the things that come, the people who come through our lives daily, like their experiences and it's all just laid bare before you, yeah. you know what I mean? Like each other, like the people who choose to go into this, yeah. the people who are like attendings in this space, like everybody's super interesting. Yeah. So I think House of God is is unique in its ability to catch the absolutely absurdity. And there's so many times in a week where you're just like, is this happening? <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, I don't, if you don't have one, other that's book. I mean, I think I honestly think it like, doesn't have to be medicine. It could be just any book that's had a huge I mean, impact I think on like you. Important stuff. Like honestly, a lot of Atul Gawande's like long form stuff yeah. for the New Yorker. I think it's like 
some of the most important stuff. Really? Like, um, what's the matter with McAllen? I think it's one of the most important things that's ever been uh. written. It's all about this uh, hospital in McAllen, Texas, that's like the highest outlier of all for Medicare claims. And he basically goes down there and he's like, what, do you, what is going on in this hospital that you are spending so much more than anybody else in the country? And he really explores sort of like, what are the practice patterns? What are What is like endogenous to this hospital that yeah. they're doing so much more than everybody else and like the patients aren't doing any yeah. better for it? Like, I think that like, if I could ask people to read one thing, it would be that. Well, I'm going to read that and I'm going to read your book. And that's going to be, it's going to, it's going to change, it's going to change my life. I know, I know it will. <laughs> Last thing, any closing words for people going into a life of medicine or surgery in anything at all, or any closing words about anything? I'd say write it all down. Yeah. Like it's, like I've kept an Evernote. Store book number two. Say it again. Book number two coming from Brian Seals we'll post-residency. We'll see. I don't know. The, um, but like I have an Evernote and like, I just like when you're an intern in particular, like you and this group of people who you've never met before get thrown into this adventure that is truly insanity. And I think like you don't have to write a, a lot down, but just like a one-liner will help stimulate memories in your brain that you'll yeah. go back and you like wouldn't possibly have remembered these things. But like, I, so I constantly like go back through and I wrote down like a lot of them for my wife too. Like yeah. she would come home and tell me these things. And like every now and then when we're just like, sit around or whatever, like I'll pull it up. And it's remarkable, like how richly you can remember these things if you just have a memory hook, right? Yeah. And so, it, and so like when we, like every, like every like eight months at best, my whole intern class will manage to make our schedules line up and we'll all get together. And we just have so much fun, like yeah. remembering like all of the absurdity and like situations each other got in and like interesting patients and stuff. And I would just say, write it all down because like you will forget it all yeah. because it happens so fast and you're so tired. And yeah. even like subtle journal entries can just bring you back there so quickly. Um, I would say, you've probably heard this before, but just like hook every experience you can to a patient, right? So like when you see a splenic injury, like that right then is the moment to go home and read about the grading of splenic injuries and, you know, sequela, if you get a splenectomy, what are the other things that can go wrong? Like whatever it is, just hook your learning onto patients as quickly as you can and make it just a habit because um, it will you'll remember it better in the same way. Just like the subtle hook of like remembering the patient lets you remember the data, I think. Um, just try to like, try to authentically appreciate it even when it sucks. This is such a unique thing. Like of the billions of people on the planet, there's so few of us that get to have these experiences and get to share them with our co-residents and get to build these relationships with patients. And like, if you can like remember that and focus on that and make that important to you, even when it's really hard, it's somehow easier if you can make that central to what you're doing and how you're feeling and how you're moving through the world. Perfect. Perfect. Well, that's amazing. We can find you at Brian Till MD, two L's on Twitter. Anywhere else you want to plug? Anywhere else you want to call out to? I don't think I no. know. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so we'll see, much, Brian. We'll see if Twitter exists in like a and month or so. And you did put your email, by the way. I don't know. That's, it's yeah. probably a good move. We'll see what happens. You um, put your email yeah. at the beginning of this, uh, in the earlier part of this episode. Oh, absolutely. Please. I'm always interested in talking to people and like, you know, Again, like we mentioned before, like there is kind of a cognitive overload. But yeah. if I can, you know, so what he's saying is bug him a lot, and, send him tons of emails, yeah, just hammer, anything, hammer just, email just ask him me. random questions, like what's seven plus twelve? Like he loves that shit. <laughs> I really miss like when I was writing a column, the amount of email that you would get from people was yeah. truly exceptional, and um, it was sort of before like everybody just like wrote comments yeah. at the bottom. And I really miss it. Like I had like great you conversations. You replied to everyone and, and stuff like that? You, not all, everyone, yeah. but like people who like wrote thoughtful things yeah. and were just like, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> like I would try I would try to for sure, you know. Fuck you, man. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, and, man. Uh, this was a pleasure. Sleep, yeah? Good luck in the rest of them. And, and uh, I can't wait to watch them all. No, this is, this is amazing. I think it's going to be really helpful. You've provided amazing information, some good stories, and some uh, unique advice too. So that's really great. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Take care, man.